percent and that's it so nothing secret okay. <laughs> Good. okay so i think we're live um i'm gonna ask um youtube to let me know if we're if everything's right on youtube so we can start presenting you Ah, okay, we already had an answer. Everything is fine over there at YouTube. Mm -hmm. That's good. I generally check because sometimes I, in 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 Streamyard we can't really know if it's if, if everything's going well on YouTube. Okay, uh -huh. and so I'm gonna introduce you in Portuguese and then we can go back to English. Okay. Um, boa tarde a todos. É, vou apresentar então o professor Rodrigo. O professor Rodrigo Aguilar é bioquímico, ele fez doutorado em biologia molecular e estuda os mecanismos moleculares que regulam a expressão gênica, com foco específico na contribuição de RNA longo não codificante e como eles recrutam complexos epigenéticos para a cromatina. Durante o seu pós-doutoramento em é, Harvard Medical School, no Massachusetts General Hospital, a, com uma bolsa da Pio e a colaboração da Merck, Uh, Rodrigo desenvolveu uma família de pequenas moléculas que se ligam ao RNA não codificante de interesse farmacêutico. Ele vai contar um pouco dessa história para gente. Hoje, Rodrigo já está de volta no Chile, na Universidade Andrés Bello. I hope I said it right. É, Rodrigo tem mais de 20 artigos publicados em revistas de altíssimo impacto, como o Brain, Cell e Nature. É, já ganhou alguns prêmios muito importantes na, na área, Young Scientist Award, MGH Fund for Medical Discovery Award, um, um Alumni Prize for Research da própria universidade, onde ele é professor, e também a bolsa da Pew Latin American um, Fellow em 2016. É, eu gostaria de deixar todos bastante à vontade para fazer perguntas ao Rodrigo, tanto durante a palestra quanto depois. É, as perguntas podem ser feitas em português, inglês, espanhol. É, as em português eu, eu, eu traduzo para o Rodrigo. É, e, e queria agradecer, então, ao Rodrigo por ter se disponibilizado a, a vir falar para a gente sobre o trabalho dele. Thank you very much, Rodrigo. I know you understand a little bit of uh, Portuguese. Uh, but now I'm going to switch back to English. Thank you very much, Rodrigo, for... for um, uh, taking time to talk to us about your work. I really hope that you, I, we can bring you to Brazil someday so you can uh, meet us and come to, to the university and, and give your talk here in, in presence in, in, you know, with us. And, and um, so, okay, so I'm gonna let Rodrigo uh, start his talk. Thank you very much, Rodrigo. Thank you so much, Priscilla, and hello everyone, bon dia. Um, I hope I said that okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Actually, I was thinking that uh, we live so close. It's just a few hours by plane. And I've never been in Brazil nor Argentina. Uh, my family has a strong connection to Peru. So basically, we go there every five to six years. But I've never been in Brazil. So I'm really, really eager to know, you know, the summer. We should definitely arrange that. Summer in Catarinas <laughs> and some talks. <laughs> I'm sorry, it would be nice. <laughs> I've been in the Sao Paulo airport though, so it's the closest I've been from, <laughs> from your land. So uh, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, as you see my, my, my slide, I always like to put uh, some bridges on, on my slides because basically the whole idea is that I'm going to be talking a lot about connections today uh, with you. Um, this this talk is entitled uh, "Building New Bridges to Fight Against Disease: Drug Discovery in the RNA Era." So basically, what I'm going to show you today is this story how, of how we discovered small molecules that bind to these very specific um, macromolecules, biological macromolecules called uh, long-known coin RNAs, and how then we tested 
uh, those small molecules in, in, in living systems. So basically, I'm going to be transitioning from a more pharmaceutical talk to a more cell biology, biochemistry, epigenetics talk. And I hope you enjoy the, the trip today. So I always love to start with this uh, slide that most of genomic information is not translated to proteins. And it is, uh, I, I was shocked when I learned that only 1.5% of the genome is actually translated, okay? It, it becomes proteins. The rest of the genome is not garbage though. It's called non-coding RNA. It is actively transcribed. And we have separated the non-coding RNAs in two families. The one, uh, the first one called short non-coding and the long one called long non-coding RNAs. Long non-coding RNAs are those transcripts longer than 200 nucleotides. That's, that's the family, so it's a pretty big family. And I bet that most of you, even me, until five years ago, uh, I worked with proteins my, my whole career. And, and now uh, I'm just here to tell you that long non coin RNAs do exactly the things that your favorite protein does. I mean, long non coin RNAs can interact with DNA, can interact with other RNAs, can interact with proteins. Uh, so it is not a surprise if I show you this table, now it's a little bit outdated from 2016, that long non coin RNAs, many of them have been linked to diseases. And here we have like cardiovascular diseases, genetic disorder, even several types of cancers uh, correlate and are linked to some long non coin RNA that is failing uh, because you have some mutation or the long non coin RNA doesn't have the correct structure or, or the protein it's supposed to be interacting with is not there. So basically, what I'm telling you is that these RNAs are super important in, in, in healthy cells and also in disease cells. And so it's six years ago uh, when I was moving to uh, the US to do my postdoc at uh, Mass General and Harvard, we decided to do a connection, a connection between academia and industry. I was trained as a biochemist in Chile. So basically my expertise was cell culture and purify proteins, purify RNA, do protein RNA interactions. And this was an opportunity to connect with industry, so with pharmaceutical companies. And from pharmaceutical companies, we learn that there are only 700 proteins that are targeted by some molecules, by drugs in your pharmacy. Yeah, you know. So basically, the, we have a huge space uh, where we don't have any drug available. So we, we have many proteins for which um, there are not any drugs available, you know, if you have a disease. But most importantly, we have this huge non-coding space, the RNAs that are produced that are never translated to proteins, and there are not any drugs available in the market for those RNAs. So basically, as I mentioned you, six years ago, we decided, seven years ago, we decided to establish a collaboration between uh, the basic laboratories at Harvard and MGH and, and the pharmaceutical company Merck. And if you look at the literature, you will see that indeed there are some examples of small molecules targeting RNA, but the discovery of those molecules was made by pure chance. For instance, I know that here there, were, uh, there might be many microbiologists and so, for instance, uh, pharmaceutical companies are always looking for new antibiotics because, you know, antibiotic resistance is a huge problem today. And sometimes, sometimes they discover some molecules that kill bacteria and downstream, uh, way, way, way later in the, in the research, they discover that the molecule was indeed targeting an RNA. Uh, some of those RNAs are called, for instance, riboswitches. They act like transcription factor in bacteria. And here I'm showing you an example of a, a paper published by, by people at the pharmaceutical company Merck in Nature in 2015 uh, about a small molecule that uh, targets a specific riboswitch, an RNA molecule inside bacteria. So this was like considered a milestone in the, in the field. And later, some scientists started to think in what if we can design rationally small molecules targeting RNAs. 
because many RNAs have structures. They have these things called stem loops, or they have triple helix. Like for instance, there is a, 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 an RNA that we study in the lab now that is called MALAT1. And we know that in the three prime end of that, of the, of that long long coin RNA, we have this uh, triple helix, uh, triple helix um, structure. So some people have been trying to design rationally some drugs, but we wanted to go forward because what's the problem I think with this rational design is that if this structure, for instance, the one I'm showing here is present in several types of RNAs, you are going to have a problem of specificity. Your molecule is going to target several different RNAs and we don't want that. We want specificity. We want the molecule that is in just one RNA. So what we designed in, in collaboration with, with Merck and an amazing team of chemists and uh, biologists uh, was a high throughput screening to find druggable RNAs. And what I did in the first steps of this project, this was uh, published in SALS Discovery in 2019, um, what we did in the first step of this project was to synthesize in vitro RNAs, several types of RNAs. I have a, a graph uh, um, later about that. And we basically uh, run screens with small molecules to check if any of the small molecules available at the company, we had access to a public library of 60,000 small molecules. Um, we checked if any of those small molecules were able to target the RNA, and also if those small molecules were targeting proteins as well. So we had some idea of specificity. We had molecules that target preferentially RNAs over proteins. And so basically, we ran this ALICE, uh, which is a high throughput screening method. I'm going to talk a, a little bit uh, uh, about that later. And basically to discover which were the hits. In other words, the molecules that were uh, targeting RNAs specifically. And as I mentioned, this was a paper we published in 2019 in collaboration with Merck people. So uh, Elliot Nidberg and Graham Smith were the, were the leads of, of that laboratory inside the pharmaceutical company. Noreen Risby now works in... in in Pfizer, I think, uh, as a lead of, of, of her own group now. She was a postdoc by that time. And basically, we published this very humble paper about targeting RNA with small molecules. And we identified selective RNA binding small molecules occupying drug-like chemical space. And to make the long story short, I'm going to be telling you about how we discover the molecules. So basically, um, this is the automatic ligand identification system. It's the ALICE. This is a machine that is available in many, many pharmaceutical companies. Uh, in this machine, what you do is you incubate the target with compounds. And for instance, you can combine with 50,000, 60,000 compounds. And then by chromatography, you can separate the compounds that bind to the RNA or don't, or, or don't bind to the RNA. And then after a few steps more, what you do is you identify which compound was binding to the RNA. So you have heat, you have something that you can, you have, you can discover. And here is the, the findings we, 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 we had a few years ago. We found from the Merck Public Library uh, dozens of compounds that were targeting RNA. So here you see, this is a list from RNA 1 to 42 for some RNAs, we found five molecules or 10 molecules interacting. So this is the main message of this, of this scheme. But most importantly, uh, if you see this, this slide, you will see this um, light gray uh, bar. What you will see here is that some of the molecules were RNA selective and non-protein binding. So basically, we know, oh, we have molecules that are binding exclusively RNAs, and this is what we were looking for. Uh, the, the, the molecule I'm going to be focusing in the following slide is here, it's hidden here, it's called uh, RNA22. But anyway, so what we learn about these molecules is that, for instance, um, they love small molecules, drugs that bind to RNA, they love structured RNAs. And in this uh, slide, I'm showing you this particular um, 
a structure that some RNAs form. It's called the G quadruplex. It's found in many types of RNAs. And when you have a G quadruplex, uh, like um, in some RNAs we were studying, they, 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 they had the tendency to form G quadruplex. Molecules, I'm, I'm talking about uh, hundreds of molecules, may bind to that, uh, to that uh, structure. But for, for other structures, we find we found like uh, 10, 12 molecules binding. And um, the number of molecules doesn't really correlate with the length of the RNA. Uh, we, when, we, when you talk about a long, long coin RNA, you may be talking about 8,000, 12,000, uh, 15,000, 1, 5, 15,000 nucleotides in length. But that doesn't mean that there are going to be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of molecules that are going to be binding because molecules love to bind in um, structure areas. And I'm going to mention you uh, in some slides more that uh, RNAs have structure areas. So basically, this is the first message from these slides for you, is that if you have a structure RNA, a molecule could bind it. OK, so this is the, the first take home message for you. And one of those molecules is helping us to understand a very important biological mechanism. And I hope, I'm sorry, I'm going to do this because I found this slide here. So basically, the story I'm going to be telling you is how we focus in one of the molecules we discovered with the RISB team in 2019, we published in 2019. And this molecule allows us, and we're so happy and proud of this paper we published just a few months ago in Nature, uh, how we target this very uh, important long non coin RNA for cellular function that is called EXIST. I'm going to be telling you what EXIST does and what's the mechanism and how a molecule basically uh, interrupts the mechanism uh, EXIST is performing inside the cells. So as I mentioned you in the beginning, I'm going to be slowly switching from pharmaceutical to uh, cell biology and biochemistry. So I'm going to just uh, uh, do this plot twist now and talk to you about dosage compensation and X chromosome inactivation. What is this? So basically, the whole idea is that in every female mammal, inclu including women, OK, women in the audience, women have two X chromosomes, while male only have one X chromosome. And what we know is that in mammals, females silence one X chromosome to prevent the imbalance in, 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 in gene dosage. So basically, every woman from the embryonic stage to the adult stage, every woman in every cell have one X chromosome silence. And we call it the X inactive chromosome. And you can see this on the streets, for instance. It's very particular if you see a female cat you will see some patches of fur. So for instance, this, this female cat or calico cat, we call it here, um, they have like a black patches and orange patches of fur. And you will see that, you learn later that, um, so uh, fur color is encoded, it's codified by the X chromosome. So in some cells, they have silenced the orange color. And in some other cells, they have silenced the black color. And that's how you find this pattern in, 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 in this domestic cat. So it's, it's really beautiful. And this is X chromosome inactivation in front of your eyes. And molecularly, as at the molecular level inside the nucleus, we know that X chromosome inactivation is coordinated by a long, long coin RNA called EXIST. So here I'm showing you just a zoom to the X chromosome to find several genes. These are all non-coding genes. None of the genes produce proteins. So basically, the RNAs that are in, uh, codified from them are the ones that perform the function. And here you have exists. Exists have seven exons. And most importantly, there are regions within the RNA that are really, really important for function. Exist was discovered in 1990 by Caroline Brown. And then we have had like 30 years of studies. The studies are currently still being made to understand better this molecule. So this is Exist. And for the most of my presentation, I'm going to focus in the five prime end of this RNA. The, the, the one we call the repeat A is a highly repetitive region that is 
um, you can find at the beginning of the RNA. Okay, this part is the one that is related to gene silencing. Yeah, and so if you know, X is the one is the is the RNA that is coordinating the the X chromosome inactivation. And how does X do that? Uh, in stem cells, before fertilization, in stem cells, both X chromosomes are active. So this is right after fecundation, a few hours. But then what happens is that from the future X side, the, from the future X inactive chromosome, X is being transcribed. And then this happens in the first three to four days of your life. X covers the X chromosome. So, uh, we, we call it in the field, X paints the X chromosome and then prevents the, that, the genes from that X chromosome to be transcribed. But exist doesn't do this alone. Exist is coordinated with something we call epigenetic enzymes. For those who don't, uh, who don't know, epigenetics is this, uh, are the studies of how we can influence the expression of a gene without changing the gene sequence, okay? So here, what we are talking about is that, is that exist, basically what it does in the X chromosome, recruits uh, exist uh, calls for a big epigenetic complex. These are proteins. This is an epigenetic complex named PRC2. PRC2 doesn't know where to go unless exist basically says, okay, PRC2, you go here. And what PRC2 does is to modify histones. Histones are molecules that interact, well, are proteins that interact with DNA, okay? And basically, PRC2 modifies histones. It introduces three methyl groups on lysine 27 or on, each, on histone H3, okay? So basically, in the end, uh, what EXIST does is that uh, coordinate an epigenetic mechanism called three methylation of lysine 27 to silence the genes, and this happens exclusively on the X chromosome. So I'm showing you this with carefully because I'm going to be uh, coming back to this mechanism in, in, in this following slide. So I hope you can all follow me. So this is the second message. We knew this the exist long known coin RNA pretty well. And actually I was telling you that uh, exist was discovered in the 1990 and then there were like 25 years of studies until I arrived to the Ginny Lee's lab in, in, in Harvard. So exist was a really good candidate to test RNA binding drugs. So if we wanted to know if a drug was doing something in the cell and it was specific and command a cellular mechanism, disrupt a mechanism, exist was a great proof of concept. So basically, we focus in the, on the study of this exists. And here is the place where drug discovery meets X chromosome inactivation. By the way, this is a beautiful train bridge we have in the south of Chile. The, the bridge is called Mayeco, was constructed in the 1900s. And I love to just show it to you. And if any time of your life you come to the Patagonia or the Araucania place in, 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 in Chile, you may see this. Um, this bridge from the highway. It's a beautiful, beautifully maintained bridge. The, the picture though is very old. Uh, you see this like, uh, I, I don't even know how to name this train. It's a very old train. And, but now it still is in service and there are more modern trains passing by this bridge. Okay, let's go back to the science. So from the early studies, here I'm showing you the molecules we were studying in, a, in our nature paper. I'm going to be focusing in the lead compound. We call it X1, X because of exist, okay? And we knew that um, we discovered basically that this compound was binding only to exist in our screens. X1 was not binding to any proteins. Uh, we determined some values of um, uh, affinity, and we basically had to discard that X1, that X1, I'm sorry, X1 was binding to the DNA. So this is an RNA binding molecule. And we started with some in vitro experiments. So this is a very, very classical biochemistry experiment I'm gonna show you now. Basically, uh, if you want to study if something is interrupting the interaction between exist and the PRC2 complex, the epigenetic complex, you can perform this in vitro site called EMSA. Uh, here I'm showing you an EMSA result. So basically the whole idea is that in absence of the drug, 
the RNA interacts with the protein. You see this in the upper bands, you see interaction. But then when we added our drug, the X1 drug, we see that uh, the interaction is, is having problems to happen. So basically, you, I hope you all see that these bands are more uh, faint, are, are, are more difficult to see than these bands. And this basically means that the protein and the RNA are not interacting that well. So we have a molecule now that is preventing XCs to interact with PRC2. So this is in vitro. You have to have the RNA purified and the complex purified, and then you do the interaction in vitro in absence of presence of the drug. But now we move to cells. And I, I, I really like these this results because in the laboratory, in, in the Gini Lee's laboratory, what we had what were like these uh, female stem cells. Uh, female stem cells form colonies when they are in the stem cell uh, stage. So what you see here is here, uh, what I'm surrounding with my pointer are like a hundred of, of cells forming a colony. That's the way stem cells grow. But then if you allow the stem cells to differentiate, just like an embryo it, that is growing, um, they tend to form these embryonic bodies. So basically what you see here is like an embryo-like uh, organization, okay? And then if you allow these embryonic bodies to attach to a cell plate, you are going to see this that I call like a fried egg, you know, a, an egg that you throw to the pan and fry with, with oil. And you see this is the center of the, of the embryo body and then the embryo body start growing, okay? And basically the cells that are growing there are the cells that are going to form in the future your neurons, your gut, your skin, okay? So this is what happens when you do this in culture. So in presence of the drug, okay, in these female cells, in these cells from women, in presence of the drug, we stopped development. So basically, the stem cells don't have any problem. They form the embryoid bodies, but those embryoid bodies don't grow. They are stalled, they are stopped uh, during, their, during their development. And this is very interesting because I'm going to come back here. I mentioned before that exist starts being produced while development is happening. So in the beginning of differentiation, you don't need exist, but then three, four days later, you need exist to silence X chromosome. So this is what we are seeing here, basically. Stem cells are, don't have any problem because they don't have exist expression. But then when you start development, you see how this drug basically stops development for a mechanism I'm gonna be talking in a few, in a few slides. But most importantly, male cells, okay? So cells get uh, gotten from, from, from men, they don't care about the molecule, okay? So we have the X1 molecule added to the culture and our male cells grew happy and healthy. And I, I just have to stress, XCIS is a molecule that silence genes in females, not males. Actually, uh, male cells don't produce exist at all. So basically, when we saw these results, we were super happy because we said, okay, we have a molecule that is specific for women and not for men. Okay. And now we go more to the more molecular part. Uh, here is just to show you, these are Im I immunostainings, okay? Each one of these blue dots are the nuclei. And here what you see in this uh, beautiful uh, red magenta color is the three methylation of lysine 27 that PRC2 deposits uh, introduces to the, to the histones when X is recruited to the X chromosome. What you see here is the silence X chromosome. And here in the left side, what you see is the control condition. This is how you see any uh, female cell in, in culture when you do the, the immunostaining, basically the, 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 the X chromosome has a, this beautiful red color because of the epigenetic modification is happening here. And our drug basically prevents that to happen. So, so far what we, um, what we learned was that XCIS prevents the interaction with PRC2 and in cells prevents that PRC2 basically deposits 3-methylation of lysine 27 to the X chromosome. So basically we are 
avoiding the epigenetic mechanism that leads to X chromosome inactivation. We can also see that using chip seq experiments. So this is next generation sequencing here you see from chromosome one to X. And basically here you see how the three methylation of lysine 27 on histone H3 accumulates throughout the genome in, in embryonic cells, in uh, uh, embryonic cells that have been developing for a few days. You will see how here I just going to focus you here in the X chromosome. And you will see that the mark is huge because basically these are female cells and you will see how this mark is it's really, really, really abundant uh, with respect to the other chromosomes, okay? And uh, we see something similar when you uh, check the PRC2 deposition. PRC2 is the epigenetic complex, but now I'm gonna come back just to show you something very important. That is that here where my, where my pointer is, is the accumulation of the epigenetic mark in control cells. And what our molecule does is basically prevents that accumulation in the X chromosome. But the rest of the genome looks kind of similar in the other chromosomes. And XCIS only works in the X chromosome. So this was this were very good news for us because we have something that is now specific for, R, for RNA, for, for the RNA XCIS. We have something that is specific for females. And in females, we have something that is specific only for the X chromosome that is where, um, where XCIS work. So those were very good news for us. Now, we also tested the expression from the X chromosome of several very interesting genes. Here are some genes that uh, are clinically relevant. For instance, MECP2 is a gene uh, expressed from the X chromosome uh, that you can find in, 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 in patients with Rett syndrome. And uh, what you see here in the black lane is the classic um, silencing curve of MECP2. So, in embryos, one day cells, two day cells, it's expressed, but then it's slowly being repressed. This happens with also with several other uh, genes like HPRT, BKK1, ATRX, related to several syndromes. But what our molecule does, it basically prevents the silencing. Yeah. And you see how a gene that before in the black line was silenced, now it becomes expressed again. And for some uh, genes, even we will say to the level of the of an active X chromosome. So basically what we were doing was preventing the, 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 the gene silencing, okay? These are just some controls from the other chromosome, the chromosome that is not affected. And then we did some RNA-seq. So basically we just didn't focus in the, in the four or five genes. We basically took RNA samples and then sent them to a, 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 an Illumina facility just to check how how big was this and uh, the change and basically uh, we found a low number of of, of target in autosomes the, the 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 chromosomes that are not the x chromosome or the y chromosome and if you throw the drug you will see just a couple of dots here that are the genes you'll see here the rna levels from the top the genes that are up regulated to the bottom the genes that are down regulated and we found from the potential 30,000 genes that can be expressed, a couple of dozens of genes that were somewhat changed in the expression across the, all the other chromosomes. So uh, this reinforced the idea that our uh, molecule was really specific for, for X chromosome. So in summary, a small molecule binding to the long non-coin RNA exists, disrupt X chromosome inactivation specifically and not in other chromosomes in male cells etc 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 so now i'm going to my my final slides and some of you may be wondering uh, what about rna structures and how does the molecule affect the structure um, spoiler alert ex uh, to determine uh, exist structure is super challenging and complicated several labs have been trying to do it and just as a Pause, I'm here I'm showing you another beautiful bridge from the south of Chile in Patagonia. This is called the ISEM bridge. So if any, uh, if you decided to come someday in your life to Torres del Paine, uh, Patagonia in the south, in the deep south of Chile, just close to the Antarctica, you may go to this uh, beautiful town. It's always cloudy and you can see the mountains and the snow. It's a pretty, pretty beautiful landscape. Back to the science. Okay, so... I just devoted one slide to discuss this with you. 
exists, we know from several other experiments that exists the RNA fold in several conformations. And there are pro probably if you work with proteins, you may be uh, familiar with um, X-ray crystallography and SACS experiments, which are like X-ray in solution. Um, there, RNAs are really kind of, no, 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 not kind of, they are difficult to be studied by, by, by uh, crystallography. There are some examples of them, the tiny RNAs with really, really defined structures, but XCC is a huge molecule. So basically what we did was we in vitro transcribed exist uh, and we sent it to a facility. And this was a collaboration with a Canadian group uh, uh, led by uh, Trushar Patel. And basically what they helped us to do was determine the exist structure. And we find that not only one, but a dozen of structures, like 13 structures at least were present in exist. In exist. So basically, uh, exists is like a scaffold molecule that binges, it, it has flexibility, folds to interact with other proteins. And this is on the top, basically I'm showing you the dominant conformations, this is still low resolution, and some other conformations that were predominant in this, uh, in this molecule. But what we found with our molecule, so basically on B I'm showing you the exist structure in presence of the X1 molecule, what we found is that our molecule stabilized. So basically, in some form, um, help exist to reach a shape. And it was, we found a non-biologically active shape, meaning that when you fall exist in certain way, like the one you are seeing here, this exist molecule is not able now to interact with their epigenetic partners and eventually prevents the silencing of the X chromosome. And this is what we found here. So we are currently uh, in, in collaboration with the Patel Lab, conducting more other experiments, more, more experiments uh, to go uh, further in, into this uh, knowledge of the, of the RNA structure and conformation, because as you see here, RNAs can fall in several structures. So that's that's the tricky part of, this, of these studies. So concluding, we have developed a small molecule that specifically targets a domain within the exist low non-coin RNA. The targeting of the repeat A is sufficient to stop X chromosome inactivation in differentiating female cells. And it does so by stabilizing the RNA in a non-biologically uh, non active conformation. So um, basically in the end, we, can, we, we could restore X chromosome uh, and, and basically uh, we, we, we we could we could make it <laughs> after six or five years of, or what we could demonstrate that this is possible to do and in my final slides i have this beautiful picture of the lab where i perform my postdoc so that's me younger and happy uh um, so that's genie that's the the boss yeah you know the pi of that lab uh, she's an, an amazing amazing she was an amazing mentor and she's still you know uncovering the 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 deep of the of the of the of the RNA biology, but also we didn't do uh, this alone. I talked to you about connections. We had to do a really really great amount of work in collaboration with Merck Research Labs in Boston and also the Trusher Pater Lab that helped us with the structural part of the RNA. So my life in the last two years have been changing drastically. I had to travel eight thousand kilometers. To the south so now i'm based in santiago i'm actually giving you this talk from santiago de chile and here i just started my 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 new lab these are the first people working in the in the lab so we have called it the laboratory of rnas and disease at the university of andres bello and i hired my first research assistant daniela and i have my first two undergrad students working hardly working uh, working uh, every day and now we have been focusing in, in another uh, long non coin RNA called MALAT1 that has been found in several types of cancers. And that's a really, really big topic we want to uh, nail uh, in order to uh, you know, bring hope to several people. So, and we have funds from the Chilean government so far. We are applying to some more funds now to keep the lab growing. Pew, uh, Priscilla was also, Priscilla Olsen was also a Pew fellow uh, uh, with me that same year. Pew helped us to you know, buy the equipment. And so now we have a fully equipped lab and we are super, super uh, 
you know, uh, uh, happy and hopeful that, that these labs work in Chile. Uh, we have been trying to do it for the last two years, uh, you know, in the middle of the pandemics and et cetera. So you can find my information. You can find, follow me on Twitter. So I, I, sometimes I post things about science and more personal feelings about scientific life. And also we have a very humble web page that we, have, uh, we hope it grows in the future. So thank you so much. And I see Priscilla there. Hi, Rodrigo. Thank you so much for your talk. Estamos abertos a perguntas. Quem quiser fazer perguntas pode mandar pelo YouTube, que eu recebo aqui e faço pelo, pelo StreamYard. Uh, okay. Ah, ok. Uh, so we have, uh, we have for you, Rodrigo, from uh, Professor Renata Meirelles Pereira, which is also from Pew, from, not from our class, but a previous class from us. Um, okay, she's, she's saying very nice work, Rodrigo. I don't know if you missed that in the, if I missed that in the first part. How did you choose the minus, um, actually, the 40 potential target RNAs for the screening with small molecules? Okay. Um, yeah, they basically were um, a selection of several types of RNAs. We had viral RNAs. I mean, you know, uh, RNAs that we can find inside virus. Um, uh, long non-coin RNA, short RNA. So basically, we wanted to a, do a screening uh, uh, um, in which we, I'm sorry, thinking in Spanish and then trying to <laughs> uh, to, to answer in English. Um, so basically, we wanted to cover several types of molecular mechanisms and, and things like that. So basically, we took a bunch of, of different RNAs, not only focusing like in a long non-coin RNA from the X inactivation. We also have non-coin RNAs that are, are working in, on, in, other, in other processes, like as I mentioned you, uh, um, coding uh, non-coin RNAs with several uh, repeats like G reach, A reach, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we, we we wanted to cover a big amount of RNAs uh, in those uh, 40, 40, 42. Okay, so we have another question from uh, this time is from Luis Tan. It's so it's saying it's really inter interesting work. Could you elaborate on the screening of six, approximately sixty thousand small molecules? Were they chosen randomly? Um, okay, so the sixty thousand, it's a, it's what it's what, what the company called the diversity library, meaning that they in, in the company they have these uh, libraries of molecules that have different uh, properties. I want two, one ring, two rings, three rings, uh, rings with modifications, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, long molecules, short molecules, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this is the pretty much the standard when, when you start any screening, but this was a library provided by the company. So they basically said, if you want to start a screening with us, you have to start with this 60,000. There, there was another one, a bigger one from two, two, uh, how you say that? 250,000 molecules, that, that was too big. Um, so yeah, and on the screen, you know, could you elaborate on the screening? And, and yeah, and, 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 and basically the whole idea is that uh, we had to apply to a project with Merck. It's called a Mint Initiative. And then we uh, basically um, brought our RNAs to the company. And in the company, we were received by the chemists and the people inside. And they basically manipulated all the, all the compounds, the libraries, et cetera, et cetera. We were more restricted to do that. Uh, actually, this work had to be maintained in secret for several years. Uh, but then we did it. So uh, that's how you start. The company says, okay, these are the ones you can test in order to, um, to, to, to see if you find any hits uh, against the, the RNA. Okay, so Renata has another question. Uh, Professor Renata is asking, okay, beyond the fantastic biological findings, do you see any potential application of targeting cysts, uh, for example, in rat syndrome treatment? Oh, that's, that's a great question. Actually, uh, Jeannie's lab, my, my mentor in, in Harvard, she has been working in the therapeutic strategies, as you mentioned, uh, against uh, red, red syndrome. And so basically for, for the people in the audience who doesn't know, um, the whole idea is that uh, in red syndrome, you have one copy of a molecule called MECP2 uh, that is mutated and the other one that is wild type or normal, we're going to say. 
And since the X chromosome inactivation is random, what happens is that in the in the girls, basically, uh, this disease also affects men, but we mostly focus on in the girls. What you have is that some cells are expressing the healthy copy and some other cells are expressing the diseased copy. And so the Genius Lab has been uh, proposing for the last five to eight years, an idea that you can reactivate the healthy copy from the inactive X chromosome, okay? So that's, that's the idea. So if you are able to reactivate the X chromosome that is silenced and you have there the cure, the cure is inside your body, if you want to think about that. And so, yeah, more or less, that's the strategy they're working and this molecule have the potential to do that. So that's one of the, of the, the potential uses of this molecule in the future. With, with some tweaks, but that's, the, that's the, the main idea. Okay, um, there are people congratulating you for your great talk and thank you. And uh, I, have, I have actually a question if, um, of my own, which was thinking about the uh, stability of, of, you mentioned exist stabilizes this structure, actually, actually X1 stabilizes the structure of cyst on the last slide. And I was thinking, how long lasting is this effect? Uh, does it th does it get broken up and then in a few hours, days, everything is back to normal, or is it stable? How does it work? Oh, I, you... I ran those experiments, and and I I I, I, I never showed them. But uh, basically, if you if you put the molecule in in culture, okay, if you put the molecule in culture while the molecule is there. Uh, the RNA doesn't work. So you see, the it's it's very interesting. The embryoid body that that fried egg I'm showing you in in, in some slides ago, um, the, the the embryoid body doesn't grow while the molecule is there. But once you remove the molecule, immediately you restart the system. The the embryoid body starts growing again. So it, it's it's a reversible uh, mechanism. So it's, it's it's super interesting and it's very beautiful because. Sometimes I maintain the molecule five, seven days in the system. The cells didn't die, but they were like stopped. And then I removed the molecule and the cells started growing again. And is it targeted somehow the complex, the complex of exists with X1, for example, is it targeted and broken up? And then uh, is it fixed somehow by the cell? You know what I mean? Like if you, if you don't keep adding X1, if you just leave it that way, does it, does the self, uh, get rid of, of X1 exists and then produces another one. And then, you know what I mean? I, I'm thinking about the, uh, in the long run, if this is a therapy, how will it work if cells are able to get rid of the drug or, or does it stay there? And Oh yeah, we performed some experiments with a treated drug with the radioactive drug. And we knew, for instance, that the, the drug tends to accumulate inside the nucleus, so it's not pumped out like very easily. Um, but uh, here you are fighting against the geometry, meaning if you have a, we have to choose a dose that uh, was able to, you know, um, block uh, all the RNAs inside the cells. Good for us is that long non coin RNAs usually are in 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 a few number of copies within the nucleus, within any every nucleus. So I'm talking about 50, 100 copies. So basically very low amounts of the drug would be able to block all of them. But yeah, I mean, if you wait two or three days without replenishing the drug, you're going to have new molecules arriving because of transcription, mm -hmm. and then you could overpass the, the mechanism. So yeah, you, you, you need to maintain a, the drug at certain amount to block the, the, the RNA. Okay, um, I think some of the questions were already done. Thank you so much, Rodrigo. Everybody's congratulating you. It was a great talk and we learned a lot from you. Uh, obrigado a todos por assistirem. Um, I hope to see you soon in Brazil. Thank you, Priscilla. Thank you. I hope you understood everything. A lot of topics, but I hope you enjoyed the talk. Yes, we did. Thank you. Tchau, pessoal. Até a próxima.